And welcome to this episode. My name is Morten Albeck. I am a photographer. I am professional shooting video and taking a lot of photographs. And then I teach at workshops as well. Street photography, portraits and more. Before we start, I will just say that at the end of this video, I will talk a little bit about my workshops I'm planning and you are welcome to join them. But first of all, let me introduce what we are talking about today. And that is what camera should you buy? The most frequent question I get. So I will give you some advices and hopefully that will help you to decide exactly what camera fits your needs. I have highlighted five subjects I think you should consider before buying a camera. But just before we start, I'll just announce that at the end of this video, I will talk a little bit about the workshops I offer and hope you will be interested to join them as well. And if you go down in the text below the video, you can sign up for the newsletter and visit the website where you will have more information. So what? camera should you buy? Should you buy an expensive camera or a cheaper camera for your photography? But first of all, you have to look at yourself and ask yourself some questions. And I have highlighted five questions you could ask yourself, which I hope will help you to decide what camera is for your needs. First of all, it all depends on what type of photography you want to do. Are you interested in portraits? Are you shooting sports or nature? Or a lot of street photography as I do and what this channel is mostly about? Or is it something completely different? That's what you need to know before you look at what camera you need. If your main subject is walking around a city to make street photography, or bringing a camera for your vacation, then choose a small and light camera so you're sure you will bring it. Else, if you have a big clumsy camera, you will never bring it out. That's at least my experience and I know other people have experienced the same. So for vacation photography, for street photography, go small. If you are into sports, if you are into shooting wildlife or natural scenes or um, landscape photography, then you can bring a larger camera, you can even bring a tripod because that will bring you the best for those pictures. For street or vacation or travel photography, go small, small lenses, small camera bodies that will make it much easier for you to bring it around and you will be sure you actually are going out to shoot some pictures. If your camera is clumsy, it probably will just end up at the hotel room or at your home, whatever your day is offering. The cameras could be the more expensive like an M system. It can be a Sony A or Sony Alpha. It can be cheaper cameras like the Fuji X100 or the slightly bigger Fuji XT series or Ryko or it can be an Olympus OMD. All of these things are difficult to remember so I have put up an article on the website so you can go in there and read this whole thing in text and recapture what I'm talking about here. But stay tuned because we have other things to talk about as well. I have made a list of five cameras for street and vacation photography or travel photography whatever you want to name it and then five other cameras that are good for sports and for landscape photography and all of this Sometimes it's a great zone because one camera can be used for one thing, but also for the other. It's up to you to decide. So let's move on to subject number two out of five. What sensor should you choose? Both the Sony Alpha here, A7R3 and the Leica M system are full frame cameras. So they have a full frame sensor to take in light. This makes them able to take up much more light 
for night or street photography in the evening, for example, which will give less noise than smaller sensors. The full frame sensor is equal to what we know from the film days, analog film days. People are still shooting on that, of course, so that's not to say that it's over, not at all. It actually have a renaissance and people are beginning to use analog films a lot today, but it demands you are more dedicated than I am because I go with digital. It's fast, it's easy and easy to publish and to, uh, and to alter afterwards in post-production. Full frame sensors are more expensive than smaller sensor crop sensors. So if you choose a camera with a full frame sensor, you have to pay a little more, but you get that extra value. It also have that effect on the lenses you use that if you use a wide open lens at 1.4 like the Sumilux 50mm, those of you who have watched uh, the previous video will know this is my favorite lens. It will give you a shallower depth of field than if shot and a crop sensor you will not get the same shallow depth of field and a nice bouquet as you get with a full frame sensor. But if you are not into that, if you are shooting at higher aperture rates like 5.6 where you uh, go for a deeper sharpness in the picture, then you don't need a full frame sensor unless you shoot at night and try to keep the noise down in the picture. So it's always a trade off from one or the other, depending on what you choose. And higher ISO settings, which is a international standard of how much light the uh, camera can capture or actually the sensor can capture, the more noise you risk to get into your picture. If we look at the ISO settings, it means that you have in the Leica M9 here, you have to go into the menu, which is a little awkward in the newer cameras, M10 and M11, have a dial on top of the camera, so we can easily set the ISO, the sensitivity of the sensor at that, instead of going into a menu. At the Sony, it is the same, you have to go into the menu, or you can use a dial at the back of the camera, which makes it much easier. Else, it's about having a good sensor, a sensor that produces image quality that you like and different sensors from different brands. So Sony, Fujifilm, Ryko, Leica, Nikon, Canon, whatever, will have different colors attached to the sensors, so to speak. It is like changing analog film from one Kodachrome 64 to a Fujifilm Velvia or something else it will have a different expression. Some of this we can tweak afterwards in post-production, but still some cameras produce an image or a quality or more like a feeling that some people like better than others. So you also have to choose your camera brand from that, but I'm not digging into that today. I'm digging into what things you should look at to be able to select the camera for your needs. So it's not a recommendation of what I prefer is a recommendation for you. You have to ask yourself exactly what your needs are as a photographer, no matter if it is as an amateur or it is as a professional. These are important questions to ask yourself. The next subject is what lens should I choose? And the lens is a combination with the camera and the sensor. But first of all, if we look at lenses, if you use wide angle lenses like this, and I have to check it, I haven't used it for a while. It is a 28 millimeter lens, a Sony lens, and here at the Leica I have the 50 millimeter 1.4. Wide angle lenses are traditionally, and they're always exceptions, but they are generally good for street photography, for travel photography, where you just need to capture sceneries and for street photography, I prefer a 35 millimeter lens because it's a little bit more narrow and you don't have to be that close at objects. And you can still capture great sceneries where the buildings and light formations and forms are more important than the people in the picture. When I want to capture people, I prefer the 50 millimeter lens because I get a little closer to people without stepping closer to them. If we move upwards, and look at 
everything between 70, 80 or 100 millimeters. They are good for both sports and landscape, of course. Beyond that, I would say everything above 200 millimeters is for landscape, wildlife and sports. And all of this is generally speaking because for a sports scenery, you can have a camera placed low behind uh, an action that is taking place on a soccer field, for example, and have a very dramatic angle where the players come close up and you have all the stadium and stuff like that and lights behind. So you can use lenses untraditionally used for those circumstances creatively so you get a different result. But that's another talk. Choose your lens from what you shoot most. So if you are a landscape photographer, then use something that can take in the landscape or cover it all. So it can be everything from a wide angle up to 100, 200 millimeters. If you are a street photographer, use a 35 or 50 millimeter. If you shoot portraits, you can use both the 50 millimeter, but else go from 70, 80 millimeters up to 200, because they produce images that are more natural to the way you look at people with your own eyes. About that, sports, action, wildlife go for tailor lenses, but they are bigger and heavier. So that's the second thing you should think about. Is it for a street photographer, you need smaller lenses. So go for fabrics that produce small lenses, like the Leica, like Fujifilm, the Fuji X100 with a fixed lens at 28 millimeters, which is an APS-C crop sensor, a fixed lens that is equal to 35 millimeters, although the mark says 28 millimeters is equivalent to 35 millimeters. In the article, link below the video, I have listed those cameras and there are links to examples of pictures shot with that camera as well as it is with the case with the Leica M. So if you want to look at how a fixed 38mm lens equal to 35mm repeated looks like, go in and watch that link in the article and there will be samples so you can see if that is the lens you want to use. Small lenses for street and travel and then you can use heavier lenses, bigger lenses if you have the time and the, make the effort to go out in the countryside, put up a tripod for example to capture really big sceneries where it's not about the problems having the camera with you all the day long but you're going exactly for that. There you can use heavier lenses. Let's go to the elephant in the room. Pixel hunting. Issue number four, the question you have to ask yourself, how many pixels do I need to capture a good photo? And there have been a chase the last years on expanding pixels over and over again. So today you can get up to 60 megapixels and probably more. For what need, I have to ask. If you are not printing large prints, I think this uh, pixel hunting has just Going, gone insane. They're still going strong. Like an M9 camera was introduced in 2009 with an 18.5 megapixel sensor, and that is far enough for most photography. If you do not make really big posters, this picture behind me at the wall was shot with the Leica M9, and it looks beautiful up in that size, which maybe is the maximum size you will print from a sensor with that capability. But if you don't need to make really big posters and print pictures larger than that, 18.5 megapixels are enough. At my work I use a Sony Alpha R4 and 5 and they have those 60 megapixels and I can't see what I should use them for. I never crop a picture that insane that I need all those pixels. But for landscape photography, where you need a lot of detail, that might be a good solution if that's what you're going for. Also for sports, if you need to crop a lot afterwards, where your lenses can't reach or you are shooting safe, so you capture enough of the scenery and then crop afterwards, well then maybe 60 million megapixels is what you need. But ask yourself if you ever need it for print, 
for larger prints or you're just looking at it at a computer screen because then you do not need a lot of megapixels. Now, when you have decided what type of photographer you are, what you want to do, if you want to travel light or you can go heavy, you have chosen a camera body that works with that, either a small camera body or a larger EVF, electronic viewfinder camera, then you have narrowed it down to two points. Then you have chosen a sensor of your taste, fits in with one or other camera type. You have chosen your lens, so you know what you can shoot with that lens, even if it is a zoom lens and you need that variation, that's fine too. Then fifth and put last, because I think it is of course important, but less important that the above mentioned items because it can be adjusted and that is the price tag. The price tag comes with quality and of course the brand of the camera. Some cameras are really expensive. The Leica has a rumor of being expensive but when you look at it, when you feel the quality, when you know what quality the lenses produce and that it can cope with being almost uh, used as a hammer uh, to put in nails in wood, then you know why it's, it's expensive and it really holds a long time. Other cameras might seem cheaper. This lens, for example, is cheap, but it also feels a bit more pl plastic-like and it doesn't hold that much if I bang it down to the table here, which I will not do, but it is nice if you're using your camera a lot that it actually can hold to being carried around at travels or in the mountains, whatever you're doing with your camera. But the price tag can be adjusted, but quality often follows how much you pay for it. But the most important things is that you have chosen the first four points and know exactly what you want to shoot. Then you can set a price range, search for the cameras within that price range and narrow it down by checking the four selections you have done before. In the article I have listed a few examples of how you can narrow it down so you can use that as a guideline but at the end it's all your choice. Everything we have talked about here is listed in the article at the website and there's a link below. There also is a link to the workshops I'm doing so if you're interested in learning more about your camera and your shooting style getting more confidence in shooting then join up for a workshop. I have arranged a few workshops here in 2024 and also already put up for 2025. And if you have special requests or you are a group of people who want a workshop somewhere in Europe or in the world, let me know and we will figure out something about that. But else join a workshop and I will talk a lot more about this, but it's all taken care of where you are with your photography. So your level of photography doesn't matter, how experienced you are doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that you want to take photographs, you want to improve and you are interested in learning. We will walk around the streets, we will look for light, we will talk about the approach to photography and it doesn't matter what camera you bring, everything works. The most important thing is the person and the eye behind the camera. And that's what we will focus on. Read more at the website and thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.